It was September 22, 1940. Chief Seaman Seeger took a pencil and wrote one word on the calendar above the number 22. Home, then he tossed the pencil aside and, whistling, went out on deck. Seeger had every reason to feel happy. At first, when the old man had appointed him a member of the small prize crew that was to take the Tirana home, he hadn't been too pleased. It would have been fine, he thought. But a 10,000-mile excursion through the English blockade on a ship, with 14 guards guarding 300 prisoners, is far from a fun ride. When all the details are taken into account, especially the fact that the long-awaited French shore is only miles away, that is, 4,500 tantalizing meters or three-quarters of an hour's leisurely passage. It worked out pretty well. They were home, or well, almost home. A satisfied Seeger whistled louder. He whistled Tipperary. You might think the choice of tune a bit odd for a fiery fighter for the Third Reich, but it was easily memorable and brought back memories of the Atlantis. He remembered that the prisoners from Kemendine had told him how they had sung this song and Mademoiselle from Armentier just the day before their capture. Funny how obsessive some tunes can be. His father used to whistle Tipperary. He heard it and remembered it. What's that English saying? We have a long way to go. Lieutenant Munn died the French fishing boats standing near the hull of the Tirana, and the men listening with frank incomprehension to his uncertain French. They seemed to him as symbolic as a dove descending on Noah's Ark. He could hardly believe what had happened. The most dangerous trek was over, and the constant tension that had sustained him all these days had shrunk and vanished like a bullet-pierced balloon. In a quarter of an hour he, Munty, would be ashore. He would walk briskly along the cobblestone sidewalk, watch the sun reflecting merrily in the puddles, listen to the squeak of wheels and the joyful voices of women, rejoice at the sight of the green shutters on the grey stone walls. He had orders to report the arrival of the prize ship to the naval command and organise its reception. He still couldn't believe that everything had ended safely. Perhaps there was an award awaiting him? or even two, or perhaps they would be greeted by an orchestra? Mais je ne comprends pas. The voice and the incomprehensible expression on the French skipper's swarthy, weathered face brought Munt roughly back to earth. He took a deep breath and went back to the difficult task of trying to talk to a bunch of idiots who didn't know their own language. Realising that his crew's awe of their commander's linguistic abilities was waning by the minute, he explained very slowly, carefully enunciating each syllable as if addressing an underdeveloped child, that he needed to get to shore. The process was difficult and demanding, and when the agreement was finally reached, Munt felt himself sweating. Once in the Dinghai, Munt tried to engage in conversation with the French but they remained stubbornly silent. They looked at him with a phlegmatic indifference that made the German lieutenant feel a certain discomfort, and once on shore he felt that his initial enthusiasm had waned somewhat. He looked around helplessly for some person in charge, and a strange, hitherto unexplored feeling swept over him. Atlantis was a closed world, and Tirana was an extension of it, and Nauman suddenly felt the first results of his long detachment from shore. He was lonely and lost among the people, felt incomprehensible detachment from them, embarrassment in an unfamiliar environment. No, there would be no orchestra. He realised this after five minutes. He had a devilish job to do. To get through the telephone to the naval headquarters. He didn't know who he was talking to, but his interlocutor was extremely annoyed at being cut off from what he was doing. By the second minute of the conversation, Munt was beginning to feel guilty and the need to apologise. Then he talked to someone else. His new interlocutor regarded the arrival of a loaded prize ship from the other side of the world 
with less enthusiasm than a lockmaster who is pulled away from his Sunday lunch to let a rubber boat boat through. Tirana had to stay put. Due to the presence of enemy minefields, she could not enter the Gyrond without a minesweeper escort, which might not be allocated until the following morning. Uh, tomorrow morning, Munda marvelled. But that is still twelve hours away. And what is twelve hours? The voice in the receiver screeched indifferently. You'll wait. But what if enemy submarines show up? Munda protested. Don't worry. The voice laughed back. They are not here. Munda stepped out onto the sunlit quay again. He felt a vague uneasiness that he could not shake off. Naval Command West worked here all the time, he assured himself, and knew the situation better, and there was no way a ship could make a voyage like the Tirana and get into trouble at the very end. It would be too unfair. The English passengers of the Tirana viewed the French shore with somewhat less pleasure than the other prisoners. Nevertheless, even they recognised that things were not so bad. After the Spartan conditions of the Atlantis, the Tirana seemed luxurious to them. There was room enough for 95 white passengers and 179 Indians, and there were comfortable quarters and service for civilians. But still, it could not be said that the people felt as if they were on vacation on a sea cruise. Everyone understood that the final destination of their journey was the camp. On the first leg of the voyage, the optimists expected to encounter a British warship every day. When two days into the voyage, the Tirana only by happy accident parted company with a British cruiser, they were genuinely happy about it. People had been told that the Tirana would not go into battle. With such a cargo and a paltry crew, it would be ridiculous. But who knows? Anything could happen. Therefore, new fears began to appear. The approaches to the German-occupied ports were tightly patrolled by British submarines, ships from which it was difficult to expect great discretion in the choice of victims or tender care for passengers and crew. Therefore, the captives looked at the Spanish shore, which appeared in the distance with ambiguous emotions. Finding themselves, so to speak, in enemy territory, they decided to accept the inevitable and let it be. They ever awaited them. One thing was certain. They had succeeded in keeping the children safe from the dangers of the sea. Returning from shore, Munt noticed two or three children running merrily around the deck. What was in store for them? The unfamiliar conditions of the internment camp were unlikely to affect them as much as the adults. Strangely, the children of the world seemed to possess a kind of protective reflex, a kind of elasticity, an ability to find pleasure wherever they found themselves. Seeger physically felt the curiosity of the prisoners, when, instead of entering the Gironde at once, the Tirana moved slowly along the shore. He heard someone ask, what the hell are we waiting here for? The reply was uttered by a well-tempered Norwegian, a voice Seeger recognised. Surely some nonsense on the shore. Seeger, who knew the real reason, kept his mouth shut, but the rumours spread anyway, as they always did. The Royal Air Force dropped mines in the river, making it unsafe for shipping. But there's no cause for alarm. No cause for alarm. A minesweeper escort will come up in the morning and escort the Tirana into port. Well then, we'll spend another night at sea, said one of the Englishmen cheerfully. In his cheerful voice there was a clear sense of pride in the Royal Air Force, which had done such a good job. That should be noted, said the other with obvious sarcasm. This was an old sailor who had spent many years at sea. Vant was nervous and out of breath. The longer the Tirana stayed at sea, the less he liked it. Where the hell had the minesweepers gone, night had long since passed. Dawn, too. It was lunchtime, and they were still hanging around at sea, and cast more and more gloomy glances in the opposite direction from the shore. 
Siga continued to whistle Tipperary, but looked more distracted than usual. What, after all, was going on? Why can't they get into port? Another hour passed and another. Lunch was over. The smallest children were put to bed. Even war does not cancel the daytime nap for the little ones. Some women sat on the deck, the soft sun caressing their pensive faces. They were thinking of home, wondering what fate awaited them on this suddenly foreign shore. Don't worry, Lieutenant. There are no submarines in the area. Torpedo strike. One, two. For a brief moment, silence reigned. The men froze with horror and surprise. And then all hell broke loose. The hitherto horizontal deck tilted violently. One hand reel almost touching the water, the other soaring high into the air. When the alarm sounded, Munt jumped up and tried to concentrate. The siren was blaring. Women were screaming, and three hundred passengers were rushing around, driven by a thirst for survival. Shocked, Munt stared dumbly at the chaos for a few moments. Then his eyes focused on the civilian passengers sliding down the sloping deck into the water. Not that way, he shouted. If the ship turns over fast, it'll cover you. Seeger was a sailor, and he chose the right way. The hard way? He climbed up the deck to the rail, clearly visible against the blue sky, and was just about to fall over it when he saw the woman. The Englishwoman stood clutching the rail, her eyes fixed on the sky. Seeger lingered and shouted to the woman to save herself, but she paid no attention. She was frozen in place, watching the sparse clouds with a strained gaze, and mentally she was clearly very far away from the nightmare that surrounded her. Hmm. For God's sake, jump. <clears throat> Seeger wailed. The woman didn't react in any way. Jump, you idiot. The ship is sinking, cursing and cursing his conscience for not letting him take care of saving his own skin. He moved, almost hanging from the rail, to the woman. Oh, come on, we'll jump together, he said, and patted her on the shoulder. You'll get help down there? The woman turned around. Her face was calm and somehow frozen. She's mentally somewhere very far away. She's just not here, the sailor thought. She didn't understand what was happening, shock paralyzing not only thought but fear as well. Seeger tried to tear her hands away from the rail, but to no avail. Delicate thin fingers dug into the metal. Suddenly the ship jerked violently. In desperation, Seeger pounded his fist on her wrists, hoping to force her fingers apart. Jump. He almost sobbed. Another concussion and the ability to think left him. He came to his senses only in the water and realized that he was desperately rowing away from the whirlpool created by the sinking vessel. Don't worry, Lieutenant. And on the Gironde, a flotilla of minesweepers had long been standing ready. They had been standing by for many hours waiting for orders. The sailors were ready. The officers looked impatiently at their watches. It was only a matter of an order, which was not forthcoming. Due to someone's gross error, the order had come a few minutes before the Tirana received the fatal blow. In other words, too late. So instead of triumphantly escorting the valuable prize to port, the minesweeper crews had the sad task of searching for survivors among the floating wreckage. The order to go to sea came so late that they did not succeed even in this noble mission. A German Air Force plane was the first to arrive at the scene of the tragedy, followed quickly by a destroyer. Upon entering the blockade area, the passengers were warned that they must remain closed at all times, day and night, and keep life jackets with them. As a result of this sensible precaution, many people were saved. However, the percentage of fatalities was still tragically high. The accident happened so quickly that the children had no chance of survival. Robin, Sally, and their mother all perished.
Nine little Indians were also drowned. Among them an infant born to the mother we were hoisting onto the Atlantis in a hammock. As the Tirana sank, Munt began rowing to the side, shouting to the others to do the same. He knew that the sudden sinking of a ship often threw debris to the surface, which travelled at torpedo speed and could kill or maim any unfortunate person in its path. Already safe, he could not forget the three scenes of the tragedy that had been played out before his eyes. A small child on whom the sailors are trying to put on a life jacket, an English girl sobbing bitterly because she couldn't find her mom. She had just lost her glasses and was so nearsighted that she couldn't see anything even a few meters away anyway. When they found her, she was alone and holding onto a life preserver and had to be told that even if she had her glasses, she still couldn't see her mom. And then there's Dr. McGowan from the Chemendine. He became the most important and necessary person in the world. His waiting room, a.k.a. operating room, was on a wave-swept raft. He saved lives with the coolness of a renowned surgeon, who on the morning of the working day in the city hospital, bring patients to the sterile operating room on a gurney with rubber wheels. When Munt, who had done all he could to save the passengers, reached the shore, he kept muttering, no submarines, they don't come into this neighborhood, Lieutenant, and then collapsed on the dock in a fit of hysterical laughter. We heard of the Tirana tragedy a few weeks later. The news shocked everyone, both us and the prisoners. The loss of women and children was especially depressing. The cook grieved the most. I noticed that he was particularly annoyed when the galley door was suddenly swung open. But we did not know then that after the tragedy of the Tirana we were dubbed the lowest of the Nazi murderers. We had gained a reputation as filthy villains ruthlessly destroying innocent children while they cried helplessly in lifeboats. Fortunately, this rumour didn't reach us until after the war. After the sinking of an enemy vessel, we always made sure that the lifeboats and other watercraft that might give away the scene to the enemy were destroyed. When all the passengers and crew members of the Kemenites were brought aboard the Atlantis, we decided to sink the lifeboats with machine gun fire. This way two objectives were simultaneously achieved Evidence of the battle was destroyed, and the crew got some gunnery practice. Unfortunately, two of the lifeboats remained afloat. When they were discovered by a British vessel, the rescuers drew their own grim conclusions as to the fate of the men in it. You can hardly blame them for that. Empty, riddled with bullets and covered with bloodstains, the blood belonged to wounded sailors later successfully treated in our infirmary. They seemed clear evidence of Nazi atrocity. Two and two were added up, and since the loss of the Tirana was the cause of the delay in information about the fate of the Kemendine's passengers, the answer was an ominous f A British sailor sat quietly by the gangway of a battered ship. His leg was almost completely torn off, held together only by a small flap of skin. To stop the blood, it had been tugged with a tourniquet. As we stood up, he turned and looked straight at us. His face was ash grey. Another survivor stepped forward. Your first shell. He be the British sailor struggled to unk his lips from the unbearable pain and grinned crookedly. A cigarette dangled from the corner of his mouth. Hey, buddy, he wheezed. What about my leg? Do I have to take it with me? This black joke gained extraordinary popularity in our team, and respect for tough English guys who can make jokes even when they are, roughly speaking, in the arse increased greatly. The most serious among us began to think about the moral qualities of the enemy, which until then had no opportunity to comprehend. But now the opportunity to learn the point of view of the English they had any number of months ahead. When we left Germany, the Atlantis crew numbered 347. By May, we had 76 prisoners. 
In June, another 99 were added. By mid-July, the number of POWs had reached 327. But even after transferring most of them to another ship due to new victories, by September the box was full again. There were 293 prisoners on the Atlantis. For the entire time of the campaign on board, there were 1283 guests from the sunk ships. The orders of the High Command were precise and clear. The Führer's credo was to have no contact with the enemy. The prisoners were to be kept in a prison room, giving them only a short time to warm up. In other words, contact between a German and an Englishman was permissible only on the level established in the camps, which may be quite reasonable for certain categories of people on shore, but in no way applied to the conditions of our life on the Atlantis, where there were no pleasantry characteristic of shore camps. Barbed wire fever was common on shore. On a ship with its limited space, which on top of having prisoners on board, must engage in combat, its spread was impossible. Roggy thought the problem over carefully, took into account the stress of the men crammed below deck in the tropical heat, stress compounded by fear as guns rumbled overhead, and decided that such conditions of confinement could be described as unhealthy. He decided to modify the instructions somewhat, giving the prisoners as much freedom as circumstances would allow with the unconditional assurance of the safety of the ship. In general, the problem of prisoners presented us with a very specific choice. On the one hand, we could not leave the men to their fate in secluded waters. On the other hand, we couldn't go into frequented waters, thereby putting ourselves at risk. And in either case, dinghies were not at all the safe place prescribed by international laws. And from every ship we sank, new occupants were brought into our captive quarters. Eventually we made the decision to rescue everyone we could, and even took some risks, allowing the prisoners to stay on deck for up to 10 to 12 hours a day. The men needed fresh air, and we endeavoured to give it to them. The prisoners' quarters, for obvious reasons, were on the lower deck, lower than our crew quarters. Although, when the number of captives increased, we moved the Asians to the mine compartment, still the conditions for the Europeans left much to be desired. It is difficult to describe how people feel when they are in such cramped conditions. When the temperature is constantly over 30 degrees Celsius, despite the presence of special fans, the place was more like an oven, and one of the prisoners who had been there, a resident of London, once told me. It was a stinking dungeon, densely packed with bodies. An accurate description. The worst moments for the prisoners came when we engaged other ships. Although we promised that if we were defeated, they would be given the same opportunity to escape as the crew. They realized that they could face considerable hardship along the way. When I once reminded one of the prisoners that we were all in the same boat, he described their situation in one apt phrase. Yes, mate, but we'd be more satisfied if your boat was upside down. On another occasion, an English prisoner stated, why don't you cut an escape hatch in the bottom and give us the keys? It was impossible to change anything anyway. The situation of the prisoners locked below was hard to envy. It was bad for them, but it wasn't too good for us either. During the day, the indefatigable Captain Windsor used to walk the decks and persuade anyone who would listen. You realize this can't go on forever. Soon, soon enough. You will meet a cruiser that will put an end to your deeds. But in spite of the bravado of Windsor and the other prisoners, we knew that they were experiencing the agony of expectation, the fear of such an encounter, so intense that it made our own troubles seem petty in comparison. What a terrible dilemma. To know that the guns of your countrymen have become the enemy to be feared in the first place, to realize that an inquisitive friend may become an executioner. During our first operations, the prisoners knew nothing of the vessel we were shelling. 
nor of the present state of affairs. Their sleep was interrupted by an alarm signal, followed by various noises indicating hurried preparations for battle. I suppose they were most disturbed by the clanking noise of the ammunition being hoisted through the steel shaft that ran through their room. Then the guns would fire, the sound in the metal box of the hold must have been quite impressive, with the concussion spreading across the red-hot steel deck like an electric shock, and concluding with the staccato of shell casings falling to the deck. I had only once been in the prisoners' quarters during an alarm. It was only a drill, but I got a good idea of how they felt when there was a real battle going on. It was there among two hundred people, in a cramped, semi-dark room filled with not very pleasant odours, with laundry swinging on ropes stretched between the bunks, catching everyone who passed by, that I made the decision to do everything in my power to reduce at least the fears of these people. From then on we began informing the prisoners that we were going to attack, that the target was a merchant ship and that it would be over quickly. We also kept repeating that if we were trapped, the captives would have the same chance of escape as we did. Faint consolation. Perhaps, but only for those who had not been captured, in a locked, cramped room under fire. I believe that at such moments, even to the most intransigent of our guests, who prayed fervently for the end of Atlantis, there came the thirst for survival that is to every man, however strong his spirit. There is an entry in my diary of a conversation with Captain Windsor, who neatly summarized the different views of the situation prevailing among the captives and those who took them prisoner. We talked to Windsor about the hottest spots on the planet. That would be Aden or Saigon, I suggested. You don't know where the hottest places are yet, young man, he grumbled. Where? Well, then we'll go there together, I answered a little irritably. Such an exchange of barbs was by no means uncommon in the usually cordial conversations between Germans and Englishmen. Still, though each side had respect for the individual personalities of the other, we did not forget that by the will of the war responsible for our meeting we were enemies. The days passed, and the strange character of our fellowship was constantly emphasized by the manner in which the adversaries carried on leisurely conversations during periods when no events were taking place, only to instantly split into opposite camps obeying military discipline, now to cure the next attack. A curt order would sound pin fire, and in a little while new faces appeared on board, new voices were heard it was the command from our next victim. Among them were the wounded, some were beating hysterically. We were witnessing an amazing transformation. Roggy was encouraging communication between the teams, British prisoners attended our boxing competitions, Allied officers got together and created a superb place of entertainment, the bar on Broadway. In fact, the Norwegians were senior partners in this brainchild of two passengers, both employees of the whaling company, although the British soon showed interest too. The members' chain consisted of Norwegian officers' buttons strung on thin fishing line and the bar itself was a bench, on which stood either very mediocre whiskey, the spoils, which we nobly sold at a price of a six to two dollars a bottle, because we ourselves did not like this drink, or the scene some mugs with cold tea instead of alcohol, this shelter was very dear to them, and to further enhance the illusion of civilized club life, invented rules of conduct for its members. The club committee decided to accept German officers as members, but both guests and hosts were subject to an obligatory rule. No political discussions. So we forgot about the war for a while, talked about our lives, the movies we had seen before the war, the books we had read, the adventures we had experienced in that past life that had ended centuries ago. But no matter how hard we tried, 
The head of the unfortunate King Charles still appeared in front of us sooner or later, still covered in blood. Talking about home brought up thoughts of relatives and friends. Thinking of relatives made us think of the dangers they too are exposed to. You start thinking about it and willy-nilly touch the taboo topic. The reasons for the war, who is to blame, whose country is right and whose is wrong. Automatically the conversation turns to heightened tones, passions flare up, because each participant is a patriot of his country. All this is insanely interesting. But let's talk about sex. This remark could not but have a cooling effect on the heated atmosphere of the dispute. It was first uttered by a senior British officer, Captain Armstrong White, whose ship, the city of Baghdad, as you may recall, was our third victim. Let's talk about sex. In those days, this phrase was a sure recipe for bringing rampant passions, fueled by wartime and the atmosphere of the tropics, back within the bounds of good manners. But the exchange of courtesies in everyday intercourse by no means excluded practical steps concerning the broader issue at stake. Oh, that dispute sharp, all-encompassing, when every possibility comes into play. I recall some examples of manoeuvring going on behind a seemingly cordial facade. The friendly Armstrong White kept a list of our prizes, names of prisoners, arrivals and departures of supply ships, and collected other information that later proved very useful to British intelligence. The indefatigable Windsor constructed for himself a sextant, by means of which he obtained fairly accurate data as to our course. Captain Smith of the Zamzam, transferred to the Dresden, assisted the monocle-armed doctor Hunter in plotting the course. Ordinary sailors made a peephole in the bulkhead through which they could watch what was going on in the hold where the seaplane was located. They also regularly threw bits of paper into the water and made calculations of speed and bearing. All of this came to the surface as much a part of the Atlantis saga as any of the deeds of our men when the enemy's guns finally decided its fate. While our ship wandered the vast expanse of ocean, such a thing seemed pointless and was done only occasionally. But when the invisible spirit of war, commanding human destinies, plunged us into the abyss of hostilities, such actions became as much a part of our daily life as eating or drinking. We used the camouflage of neutrals to hide our guns. We studied and analysed every document we could find on captured ships, then sent what seemed important to us to Berlin. Our prisoners received information through friendly conversations with crew members. I recall a day when our doctor gave a birthday party for one of the English captains, which ended with the Englishman dead drunk, falling asleep on the doctor's bed and the latter in about the same condition stretched out on the sofa. I also remember how the English artist, taking every opportunity of contact, drew up, on the basis of what he had heard, a remarkably accurate plan of our ship. He made only one mistake. He indicated one eight-inch gun on it. Sure, some friction arose, but it was so few that it surprises me to this day. In general rules for captives, I personally edited rule number six. It began. The commanding officer shall facilitate conditions of confinement by allowing time on deck, providing facilities for personal hygiene, etc. I added, we want to hear a friendly good morning when the commanding officer or familiar officers pass on deck to see the respect with which a prisoner clears the way and the cooperation expressed in keeping the deck and facilities clean. Good morning proved to be the last straw. One of the belligerent officers inquired rather sharply what we meant. Should he order the men to say good morning and stand up when a German officer appeared? If so, we could expect trouble. I explained that I had included this clause only because of the rudeness of a small portion of the members of the commands, who, finding that we were not such brutes as they believed, 
had taken an openly obstructionist position. We are, I said, trying to behave as decently as the realities of war permit and would like our prisoners to appreciate it. What should an officer think if, on entering some room of his own ship, he had to wade through the outstretched legs of collapsed bums? The explanation seemed reasonable to the jaunty officer, and no more similar questions arose. Only once did we have to discipline a prisoner, and that was because of his insolence towards a British officer. From the outset we had the alternative of either humiliating the British officers by assuming full control of the prisoners, or of supporting and reinforcing their authority within the boundaries set by the security of the ship. We chose the second course. As far as possible, the crews of the ships were kept together. Their officers relayed our orders and were responsible for their execution, that is, they retained relative authority. For the most part, the crews tried to stay together and close to their officers, but every family is not without its faults, and there was always a small group of dissatisfied people in the crew, ballast for any ship. For such people, critics and disputants, our appearance meant only one thing. Henceforth their officers lost the right to command, and thus the eternal disputants got the right to do whatever they wished. In the case I am describing, a sailor refused to obey his captain's orders, and the latter, deprived of his confidence in his new capacity as a prisoner, was about to do the work himself, but one of our men intervened. The sailor was brought to me. Why did you refuse to obey the order and insult your captain? Um, I'm not his bloody servant, he replied. We're all equal now. He's no better than I am and he can't make me do what he wants. We sent him to the holding cell to think at leisure about his behaviour. When the captain asked for leniency for the stubborn sailor, Rog, with his usual brusque directness, you say it's a trifle, but in this case I'm not interested in your opinion. I am very much interested in discipline. If others see that a guy can easily get away with insubordination, they will follow his example, and then it'll spread to our sailors. That kind of thing spreads faster than any contagion. The sailor did not like the punishment cell, and in a few hours he fully realized that he was wrong. A harsher punishment was determined by a court-martial for another misdemeanor involving our prisoners, but this time the culprit was a German sailor. After the capture of his vessel, a British officer inquired what had happened to his binoculars, which for personal reasons were very dear to him. I replied that the binoculars were on board the Atlantis, and although we could not allow him to have the item during the voyage, it would be kept as his property. But on inspection we did not find the binoculars we wanted. Inquiries led nowhere, so we investigated. One day a note addressed to me was found near my cabin door. It said, You will never find the binoculars you are looking for. I threw it overboard. I felt this was probably true, but kept investigating. Eventually, our list of suspects was reduced to five people. I ordered each one to rewrite the note. One of the sailors, a fairly educated man, made two mistakes in the text. It became clear that he had done it deliberately, and he was arrested. He confessed and was sentenced to three months' imprisonment. I felt this was probably true, but kept investigating. Eventually our list of suspects was reduced to five people. I ordered each one to rewrite the note. One of the sailors, a fairly educated man, made two mistakes in the text. It became clear that he had done it deliberately, and he was arrested. He confessed and was sentenced to three months' imprisonment. A British officer appeared to ask for leniency. Realising that we had no intention of changing anything, he object. I would never have mentioned this thing if I had known the guy would be punished so severely. Turgi, who has always stood proudly for his men, who have served faithfully, shrugged cold. 
Save, everything will remain as it is. If I yield to one, I cannot restrain the others. By the first Akashan, the sailor was sent to Somalia to serve his sentence. I don't want a thief on my ship, Rog said. As the officer in charge of the POWs, I received constant complaints about the food, and in a diary confiscated from one of the POWs I read the following scathing remark about the Atlantis kitchen. We were then given some completely indigestible substance, something disgusting, cooked apparently from spinach resembling scattered seaweed or swamp slime. It tasted even worse. No, I couldn't agree more. Our food, of course, was not very popular, but the prisoners on their return to England were objective enough to admit that we ate basically the same thing. And we had the pleasure of reading about it in an issue of the Daily Telegraph found on one of the captured ships. The bread was the most objectionable of all. Not only were we accustomed to black bread, but we believed it to be more nutritious than white bread and a useful addition to our poor menu. It was in weekdays, not counting curries on Wednesdays. We had one meal, peas, beans, lentils or noodles with a small portion of blood sausage, also extremely disliked by the English. On Sundays we got dry potato chips, not to be confused with the delicious fried chips some canned vegetables and canned meat or goulash. I read with a chuckle the account of one of the POWs that the worst ordeal for everyone turned out to be the perpetually sour cabbage. What do you mean? Sauerkraut was a delicacy too precious to be handed out left and right, but the English treated it very differently from us, which is why the memory of this dish was so vivid. For breakfast we drank Ezat's coffee, Negro sweat, and ate a piece of bread with margarine and sometimes a spoonful of jam. The dinner menu was about the same. The most dreaded thing seemed to be the lack of water. Every man, whether German, Englishman, Norwegian, or native, was given about a quarter day to wash and drink. All the taps were closed and water was given out by a specially appointed man. We got it twice a day, after breakfast and after tea and it was strange to see an impatient line of prisoners and those who had taken them equally eager to get their portion. Yes, to satisfy a simple human need, you had to wait in line. Nothing went to waste. If there was tea left over after a meal, it was to be drunk throughout the day. If there was excess food left over after a meal, it had to be returned. I believe the general rules for prisoners sufficiently reflected the principles of our household. Take only the amount of food you need. If it is not enough, ask for more. Food not eaten because it was not to your liking or for other reasons should never be dumped in the garbage cans or pig food receptacles. It must be returned to the galley. Returning food will not cause a reduction in rations but throwing food away will. Wastefulness in drinking water, tea and coffee will also cause a reduction in rations. All in the same boat. How seeing the unenviable plight of the captives on a daily basis? Could we adhere strictly to the rules? How could we remain indifferent to the men we saw every day, hiding under the lifeboats or in the shadows of the chimney, seeking any opportunity for even a brief escape from the scorching heat, the sweat running down all bodies, regardless of their nationality, destroyed the traditional barriers between prisoners and victors. Sometimes we argued among ourselves, were we not all, in one way or another, prisoners of the harshest of the elements, the sea. The team tried to establish a correct relationship with the British, but remained constantly on guard against being caught off guard. Captain Hill of the Mandasaur said after the release that we were good guys, but, to summarize our attitude toward Hill and his friends, we could say, they are people who are nice to talk to, but in wartime it is very dangerous to trust them too much. It was called the Plutarch, but that was back in 1912 when a brand new, freshly painted, 
5,000-ton vessel came off the slipway, built specifically for trade voyages between parts of the rich and prosperous British Empire. Twenty years later, after surviving war and economic crisis, the shiny ship with engines in need of repair was sold by the British abroad. The Yugoslavs renamed it Demeter. But at the end of 1940, Plutarch was given another name, which became widely known, the unflattering title of Hell Ship. We met her on October 22, a rusty veteran whose appearance had by no means been improved by the years and the change of flag, a tramp of tramps whose chimney and superstructure were black with soot. The overloaded vessel sat so deep in the water that its cargo mark could not be seen. Yet in this floating scrap of metal lay the Atlanticism's only hope of freeing itself from the mass of prisoners. There were already too many of them, and they were causing a lot of trouble. We could not feed so many extra mouths. The conditions in the overcrowded rooms for the prisoners became unbearable in general. It was bad for everyone. But most importantly, the constant presence of hundreds of men on board made it difficult to carry out the next phase of our mission, a series of attacks on merchant shipping on the approaches to the Bay of Bengal. We hoped that the Commissioner Rammel, which had met us so unexpectedly, would be captured intact, and then the problem of prisoners would be solved quickly. This vessel was just the right size to accommodate the 300 prisoners we intended to send. But this was not to be. The spectacular but unneeded end of the Commissar only compounded our problem by adding another crew to the prisoners already on the Atlantis. We couldn't wait any longer. Hey, the Demeter is hardly the vessel you'd choose for an ocean voyage, I said. We don't like it either, but we can't find anything better. Now it's up to you. If you will cooperate with Lieutenant Denell, he can provide you with quite tolerable conditions. The prisoners gathered in front of me. Some remained serious, pondering the practical problems of the journey ahead, while others smirked. A few were quietly exchanging short phrases. I looked around at the officers. They had already become our old acquaintances, with whom we talked and sometimes drank. They were the same great guys, but, and I thought that there were almost three hundred of them, and only fourteen of us. I must emphasize, I added, that any attempt at resistance will be crushed. Don't expect to prevail, don't even try. The Demeter is equipped with time bombs. In case of serious trouble, the ship will be sunk immediately. My threats didn't frighten the English too much, nor were they alarmed by the prospect of changing the Atlantis for a barnacle-strewn old trough, which was to take them to an Italian prison camp. Our farewell proved, on the whole, cordial, and the prisoners transferred to the dem gladly must have hoped for a chance to escape. It is human nature to hope for the best. Danell stroked his neatly trimmed beard. As he watched the prisoners board his first ship, he glowed with energy and confidence. He did not turn a blind eye to the difficulties ahead, but he was confident that he could handle them. Danell liked to overcome difficulties. It helped him to keep himself fit and not to relax. He was filled with the consciousness of his own importance and was very proud of the trust he'd been given. According to preliminary calculations, the voyage of the Dermeter was to last 19 days. The prisoners were told that they would be at sea for two weeks or a little more, to keep the prisoners in a peaceful mood. Denel was to make regular reference to the message he had just received from Atlantis, which would create the illusion that the raider was in close proximity and would quell any rebellion that might arise. It couldn't be said that Denel was seriously concerned about the prospect of a riot on the ship. Of course it was better if the voyage was amicable, but if not he had at his disposal very effective means of quelling riots. A machine gun was mounted on the bridge, aimed at the bow of the ship, 
where prisoners were being held behind a barbed wire fence. When the guard called for silence to the homogeneous crowd of three hundred, Den Gentlemen, I'd like to demonstrate something to you. He waved his hand, and the silence was broken by a long machine gun burst. The bullets, flying into the water, raised fountains of spray. Was the demonstration effective? Some members of the prize team, looking at the calm faces of the prisoners, doubted it. But, as they say, it was our business to hint, and it was their business to understand this hint or not. The Dermata's passengers were primarily concerned about its cargo. Salt. They hated the name of the product, the smell, the taste, and most of all, the feel of salt. The only rooms suitable for the Europeans were in the first and second holds. They were liberated in the following we. The salt there was dumped overboard until there was enough space for a hundred men to lie down and stretch out to their full height. Salt. Of it were made the beds on which they lay, which remained stony hard, no matter how hard the prisoners worked with shovels to soften them. They were also cold, and not even the tarpaulins given to the men instead of mattresses saved them from the cold. Sleeping on such a bed brought not rest but brokenness in the whole body, but nothing could be done. Salt. It irritated the skin and inflamed cuts. It soaked through clothes and clogged nostrils. Uh, salt. And underneath it, a great many dens, a city of vermin. It was home to rats, skinny, angry rats that crawled out at night and ran up people's faces. And when they got cocky, started biting the keratinized skin on their feet. Yes, salt was the worst enemy. At least, so it seemed to the captives during the first days of the journey. But it took more than mere discomfort for the Dermater to earn the title of hellish vessel. A real devil lived in the ship's bunkers. A devil who turned a meager diet into a hunger strike. A devil who stretched fifteen days of expected trouble into twenty-nine days of sheer hell. Somebody had done his personal business at the beginning of the Dermater's voyage. Somebody cheated on the coal supply. There was a catastrophic shortage. The news gave Denel the impression of a boxer's punch to the jaw. When the ship set sail, the paperwork said it had the minimum coal supply needed to get to Mogadishu. Minimum plus a small reserve. But that wasn't the case. The entire reserve had run out. The reserve was out of the question. The figures given by the Yugoslavian mechanic were hopelessly wrong. Daniil realized with horror that the Dermata had almost no chance of reaching the shore. The food rations were quite meager even for the estimated period of time. For reasons of economy, we had supplied the prize team with food based on lower rations than existed on Atlantis. We had to think ahead, and this decision, which seemed reasonable at the time it was made, turned out to have far-reaching consequences. The more Denel saved fuel, the longer the Demeter was to spend at sea, and the longer the voyage, the lower the rations. Thinking of the bleak prospects, Denel frowned grimly. The voyage would be much longer than originally planned, and the likelihood of a safe arrival was doubtful, to say the least. But one thing was certain. He was a patriot and he believed in the cause he was fighting for. He was determined to do his duty at all costs, no matter how dire the consequences, and ordered the speed to be reduced to 5.5 knots. When the Dermater left, the weather forecast promised heavy rains. Seven days passed, but it never rained. The infernal vessel, increasingly hot under the tropical sun, was rapidly running out of water. One cup per man per day. Desperate from the heat, people began guzzling warm, rusty water from steam pipes, opening the way for intestinal infections. The guards did not interfere. They were too few in number to actively interfere in the daily lives of the prisoners. And when a crisis loomed, they had only one main task. 
to prevent a riot? At last the long-awaited rains came, and the men sprang on deck, exposing their chapped lips and weary bodies to the blessed cool moisture. They collected the precious drops in every receptacle they could find, but the rain unfortunately brought with it more than just relief. In some ways, it turned out to be an even worse nightmare. The water seeped into the holes and turned the hitherto hard salt surface into liquid mud, familiarizing those who could not make a hammock for themselves with the horrors of rheumatism and festering sores. As the days passed, rumors began to spread among the prisoners. The German crew was getting fat, eating bacon, coffee and fresh fruit. Denel personally received a deputation of prisoners and invited them to check the food store. No delicacies were found there, but the hatred continued to grow. People grumbled, looking at the machine guns glistening in the sunlight, and the sight of the officer standing on the bridge in a white cap became for them a living embodiment of the causes of their misfortunes and suffering, the embodiment of everything they hated and fought against. On November 11, both the British and Germans took part in a commemoration of the victims of the First World War. Daniel gave a short speech. A rifle shot started a two-minute silence. Another shot ended it. After that, life, or rather existence, continued as usual. The ship was sailing along the equatorial calm at a speed of three knots. The sea surface was as calm as glass, the water seemed to stick to the bottom. MacLeod, the second mate from Kemendana, during the stay in captivity mastered sextant, led observations and calculations that showed. Demeter is not going to Madagascar to land them in neutral territory and headed for Somalia. The truth about the Demeter's course, as well as the catastrophic lack of fuel, could no longer be concealed. The stench of burning paint spread throughout the ship, causing nausea in the exhausted men. At first, the prisoners thought the ship was on fire, but then they realized it was another product of Denel's ingenuity. When only coal dust remained in the bunkers, he began to make fuel briquettes from ashes and paint. Denel did his best. Pieces of tarpaulin were tied together and placed on the Selinga in an attempt to harness the power of the wind. All the ship's furniture went into the furnace. Demeter was slowly moving forward, the anxious, sweating lieutenant, not at all like the invariably neat Dinell. For a moment even believed that the prize would reach Mogadishu after all. But bad luck pursued the ill-fated vessel. From the intercepted radio message became obvious that the British cruisers bombarded the city. Shelter had to be sought elsewhere. The hatch covers went into the furnace. The stern booms were cut off and went in the same place, and the wooden deck plating followed, and the ship kept on going. On November 22, Demeter reached a small settlement called Warshake. Instead of 18 days, the voyage had taken 29. Enel, who had no charts of the maritime area, began to call a pilot from the shore. But Varshaik seemed extinct. There was no reply from the shore. By four o'clock, Denel's patience was exhausted. He decided to steer the Dermater to shore himself, and five minutes later, the ship ended up on a coral reef. So it was Somalia, but instead of glory, they were waiting for tattered trucks. To be precise, there were eight trucks, and they were loaded with not only British prisoners, but also an angry, protesting Denel along with the prize crew. They all turned out to be captured by the victorious Italians, taken to Mogadishu, where they were triumphantly demonstrated to the population to boost somewhat shaken morale. What a victory! Many hours passed before Denel managed to explain himself to the authorities, after which he and the Yugoslavs returned to the ship, clearly walking under an unlucky star, which was by then afloat again. But as it turned out, the trouble was not yet over. 
As soon as Denel began maneuvering to get the ship out to sea, it sat on the ground again. With great difficulty to free himself, Denel brought the ship to Mogadishu, where the Italians, not at all happy, demanded that he immediately put to sea. They believed that the stay of the ill-fated ship in port could provoke British bombard. Only after bringing the ship to Kisimayo, Denil was finally able to get rid of the annoying ship, breathe a sigh of relief and begin to prepare for the return to the Atlantis. What happened to the Dermater? The ship was captured by the advancing British and eventually handed over to the Yugoslaves. It is safely alive to this day. Isila recently saw it in the calm blue waters of the Mediterranean Sea. The adventures of the Diameter contain a number of factors on which I cannot dwell in detail, as I do not consider myself competent enough, but from the information available to me, consisting of the mass of complaints of the British prisoners, and Denel's statement that they might have helped him to relieve them. Three points seem to me beyond question. First, the voyage was a test of Denel's skill, who operated under very difficult conditions, but still managed to accomplish the task. Secondly, his manner of dealing with the prisoners may have been aggressive, but it never came to bloodshed. Lastly, the voyage was associated with many difficulties and hardships and the Demeter rightfully earned the title of Hellship. The situation of the European prisoners in the Italian camp was even worse than on the Demeter. They were provided with only the most rudimentary medical care. Four prisoners died of dysentery, which they caught on the voyage. Ninety-seven people suffered from the most severe. But even after liberation, the trials of these men were not over. In an Australian newspaper of the time, I read, one of the bitterest grievances suffered by some of the sailors is connected with their reception in British East Africa after liberation. The Royal Navy had a special organisation to deal with freed prisoners, so did the army. Merchant seamen found themselves like unwanted children left on the doorstep. Fighting officialdom unites nations. As British cruisers followed the Demeter to Mogadishu, we on the Atlantis listened, not without irritation, to a broadcast from our propaganda ministry ridiculing the British Navy's failure to find and destroy a single German raider. In a languid tropical night, a Norwegian tanker was bobbing on the waves in the Indian Ocean. Its crew, armed with rifles, stood on deck, staring into the darkness where a boat was approaching. On it was a British officer dressed in immaculate uniform and two sailors. The cutter came alongside. For a few moments it moved along the black bulk of the hull. The officer looked up at the deck of the vessel. The men on deck looked down warily at him. As the boat rose on another wave, the officer grasped the lower chain of the guardrail and a second later was standing on the deck of the ship. With his left hand he unbuttoned his uniform tunic. With his right he tore off the emblem of the British Admiralty, a chain-linked anchor. One more movement, and he had a German military cap on his head and a pistol in his hand. I am an officer of the German Navy, he said. You are my prisoners. November 10, 1940. Our pilot, during the overflight of the territory, noticed old Jacob, and Rog planned the operation so as to exclude the use of guns, save the tanker from destruction, and save a valuable prize. And I was the one who had to dress up and act. I temporarily became a lieutenant in the Royal Navy. This metamorphosis went unnoticed by the British Admiralty, as well as the temporary transformation of Atlantis in the British auxiliary cruiser Antonov. And it turned out like this. When the pilot reported information about the tanker, we began to think about how to capture the ship intact. The old Jacob was too valuable a prize to destroy. The problem was compounded by the fact that a single shell was enough to start a fire on the tanker. But how to do without shells? Roggy say. It's very simple. 
you, Moher, will become a British officer and Atlantis respectively a British ship. We'll capture the old Jacob by stealth. At this stage of the war, we received daily intelligence reports from Berlin containing the name of British auxiliary cruises and their operational areas. This information was not supplied by secret agents, but was the result of Krieg's marine cryptographers deciphering intercepted British radiograms. The information was highly reliable, but because the deciphering process was time-consuming, it came to us two or three weeks late and was therefore usually useless operationally. The messages from Berlin gave us some kind of consolidated basis. At least we knew at least the ocean in which the enemy was located. The name of the ship Antenor was chosen precisely because its actual presence in these waters could well have been known to the Norwegian captain. On a dark, starless night, we approached the tanker. I emerged from my cabin, a perfect product of Dartmouth. At least that's what I'd had hoped for, as I had many doubts about my new appearance. Although at first I felt quite satisfied with the English wit of my person, a few glances in the mirror made me suspect that I looked exactly what I was a German in a foreign uniform. And the longer I looked in the mirror, the more I was convinced I was right. Even the British gear I'd borrowed in place of my leather belt, to which my holster was strapped, had taken on an aggressively German look, but it was the cap that bothered me the most. At what angle do British officers wear it? But perhaps I worried in vain, for although Commens, looking at me, chuckled and informed me that I could not fool anyone, Roggy nodded approvingly and said, Our powerful searchlights blinked. Um, this is the British auxiliary cruiser Antonov. What vessel? After a pause, a hesitant reply followed. The Norwegian tanker O Jacob. Another pause, and again the signal. Please do not pursue us. Stop, we beeped. But old Jacob was slow. He seemed uncertain and timid, like an old maid who had been stopped by a stranger in the park at night. The signal from old Jacob. Why are you stopping us? Our reply. This is a British auxiliary cruiser. But that wasn't enough for the old maid. She wanted more than our statement. Her radio operator sent out a cry for help, QQQ, the signal we feared most, and yet we did not open fire. Instead, with all the authority of which British naval sailors are capable, we demanded that the Norwegians stop using the radio and stop immediately, as we needed to speak to the captain. In the radio went silent. We could well imagine the sailors' indignation. These suspicious Brits are forcing us to waste precious time when we are in such a hurry. Instead of checking our papers a hundred times, it would be better to look for German raiders. The exchange of signals continued for a few more minutes, but still the tanker obeyed, began to reduce speed and stop. This I climbed into the boat. Two sailors stood beside me. Everything was done to make it seem from the outside that there was nothing in it but us. But seven more of our comrades were hiding under the tarpaulin, armed with pistols, automatic rifles and hand grenades. We were wished good luck, and the performance began. I thought I could feel waves of doubt and suspicion coming from the tanker. Never had an approaching vessel seemed so frighteningly huge to me. Never had it been so openly hostile. We saw that several Norwegians had gathered at the gun. Many were probably hiding in the shadows. No one uttered a word. The ominous silence was threatening. I didn't like the whole thing. They were too suspicious. My right hand instinctively moved toward the holster. But I restrained that natural impulse. If things didn't go as we'd hoped, the gun wouldn't help me anyway. We came aboard, and a hoarse voice. Its owner could not be seen behind the searchlight asked. Are you English? Our answer was drowned in the scrape of the boat's bow against the hull of the tanker. 
I looked for a gangway. There was none. It's not good. The officers were gathered on deck. We could make out the outline of the objects they held in their hands. Rife seconds passed, we dangled by the side. No word of greeting, no outstretched helping hand. The silence was broken only by the splash of water. The waves lazily lifted our boat, then lowered it again and hit the hull of the tanker. This could not go on, waiting for the boat to rise once again on a wave. I grabbed the lower chain of the deck railing, pulled myself up and found myself among the Norwegians. I was alone in the face of a distrust-filled, suspicious crowd. In my diary I later wrote, It's now or never. I will not allow myself to be exposed, and I will play my part to the end. In a second I threw off my mask and showed my true face. As is often the case in war, the surprise took away the enemy's initiative. I approached the officer in front, took the rifle from his hands and threw it overboard. I then pointed to the gunboat, from which my men were already coming aboard. Having received this weighty encouragement, I ran to the gangway leading to the bridge. The captain met me there. He had seen everything. I had not yet had time to catch my breath when he said, I surrender. This passage, recorded a day or two after the thrilling adventure, very accurately captures the excitement I felt when it was over. As the action unfolded, I had no time for emotion. Everything happened very quickly. If the first man from whom I took the rifle had resisted, there would have been a firefight that would have meant the end for both the boarding party and the Norwegians. But there was no resistance. We succeeded in capturing the prize intact and without unnecessary bloodshed. It was not until some time had elapsed, as I was then fourteen years younger, that I felt a strange weakness in my knees, and rivulets of cold sweat trickled down my back. After the surrender of the team, we carefully examined the prize. Bill Jacob was carrying not fuel, as we had hoped but several thousand tons of aviation alcohol. It was good, of course, that we managed to deprive the enemy of such cargo, but we were the only ones not too interested in it. But that was not my problem. In the meantime, we had to take measures to calm the suspicions of those who might open a hunt for us when they heard the first cry for help from old Jacob. In spite of all our tricks, his signal still went to Colombo so we used the tanker's radio with a distinctive key to cancel the message, and informed the British that we were continuing on our course after the false alarm. This ingenuous operation had rather amusing consequences, for not only did it completely satisfy the enemy, but also, and this is the funniest of all, it misled our command in Berlin. From there we were sent a communique stating that ships in the Indian Ocean were so concerned about our presence that a Norwegian tanker raised a panic at the approach of a British auxiliary cruiser, although later cancelling the signal for help. The incident with the tanker Old Jacob was an adventure, at least in our recollection, which formed a pleasant contrast to the usual brutality of our mission. Not a drop of blood was spilled during the capture of the vessel, and no damage was done. Unless, of course, one counts the hurt feelings as such. In order to exclude any misunderstanding of our tactics, I will explain that flying a foreign flag or going under false colours is a perfectly legal military stratagem under international law. The only condition is not to take hostile actions before the disguise is dropped. And it is permissible to use not only the flags of neutral countries, but also the flag of your enemy. The above-mentioned condition applies not only to the ship as a whole, but also to its individual representative. Therefore, I had to shed the British masquerade and reveal my German military uniform to the world before I could draw my weapon and on the Atlantis the military flag was always flown before the firing began. A subtle distinction. An emphasis on the letter rather than the spirit of the law. 
The law defines all the nuances quite precisely, and we tried to follow at least the letter of the law. About the same time, and in a similar manner, though under less strained circumstances, we captured another Norwegian tanker, the Teddy, which obeyed our signals at once. Stop immediately. What vessel? We beeped. What do you want? A search and seizure. All right. And after a few minutes. Can we go on our course? No. Wait for our boat. What vessel? As His Majesty's ship, the Antenna. Teddy, however, managed to get even with us, and by the time he was done with us our faces were burning brighter than those of his officers. Taking the command of the Teddy on board, we sent the zealous feeler aboard the tanker to set the charges. Unfortunately, this time his enthusiasm took precedence over reason, and the charges, more powerful than usual, exploded with such spectacular effect that the vessel threw up a cloud of smoke that could be seen for miles around. The powerful black column might have served as an excellent landmark for the English looking for us. Feeler created an eruption of a kind of marine volcano, thereby forcing us to quickly get away from the scene of action, like burglars who accidentally hit the alarm system while opening a safe. I was probably the only one who rejoiced at this unexpected spectacle, as I was able to capture the spectacular footage of the sinking on film, footage that was later used in the movie version of The Cruel Sea. I received no credit for this masterpiece. I was not asked for permission to use it, nor was I paid a fee. This piece of confiscated enemy property, as well as everything else, settled in the archives of the British Admiralty from whence it was obtained. I don't know what military trickery Mr. Montserrat used to obtain film footage of the tanker's demise, but one thing is certain. The horrors depicted in Cruel Sea did not really exist. There were no casualties on the teddy. We had to disguise ourselves not only as military, but also as merchant seamen in the British Navy. During our wanderings, we once impersonated a British merchant ship. To do this, we even had to destroy two dinghies we had brought with us from Germany, for use in the Pacific, as they would have been out of place on a British merchant ship. We even constructed a very convincing-looking fake gun on a platform in the stern, exactly as we had seen on our victims. Captain Windsor, who once declared that he would never have been fooled by our silhouette modifications. Certainly, if he had had our original description, sowed seeds of discontent in Ruggie's brain. Those seeds were destined to germinate during our long combat camp. We never found out exactly what was wrong with our ship's silhouette. Perhaps Captain Windsor's remark was based on the fact that ships built on the River Clyde have much lower cross beams than ours. In addition, the modern Maya carrier cruising stern was not often seen on British ships of the time. Their bridges were lower and their decks not so smooth. But despite such differences, we have found that a small amount of makeup, for example, putting on sailors' British hats and British gas masks, gives very good results. In the business of deception, the most important tool, both for hunter and game, was the radio, and, as the episode with the old Jacob and other ships showed, it too could wear foreign colours. During the First World War, the operational build-up of forces could well be judged by changes in the flow of radio signals, and London, as well as Berlin, had learned to take advantage of this. Our own methods, in the Admiralty, were to maintain a constant flow of signals at all times, regardless of urgency. Accordingly, more than 91% of the messages could be mere fillers, such as long articles from the Volkische Beobachter or advertisements like a young lady offers. A code signal at the beginning of the text showed the operator receiving the message that it was not to be paid attention to and no time was wasted in rewriting.
we had accustomed our military radio operators to adhere to a uniform style of transmission, to avoid significant changes in speed, and to give no key to identify the sender. This uniformity, however, had a number of disadvantages, which became apparent when we had to send messages which were implied to be from sources other than German. For such occasions we had two former radio operators who had served in the Merchant Navy. These we had brought with us from Kiel. These men took the key in their hands when we transmitted messages to Mauritius or Colombo. They were forbidden to adopt the impersonal manner of the military radio operators. On the contrary, they were required to keep their individual style. The day after the success with old Jacob, it was November 11, the anniversary of the armistice, our thoughts were far from peaceful. Our eyes were turned to the distance where we could see a mighty column of black smoke, signifying the approach of a very important sacrifice.